Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to our talk on the lessons learned while migrating data pipelines from enterprise schedulers to Airflow. I'm Shivnath Babu. I'm uh, male. I'm, I have um, black hair, short black hair. Uh, I'm co-founder and CTO at uh, Unravel, and I'm also an adjunct professor of computer science at Duke University. Today, my co-speaker is Hari Nair. Hari? Hey, uh, my name is Hari. Uh, I'm a man with uh, a beard and short dark hair, and I'm sitting in my home office. Uh, at Unravel, I focus basically on data science and insights, and I lead the customer success and innovation team. Thank you, Hari. So a quick note on Unravel itself, uh, where Hari and I work. So we are building a platform to simplify data operations. So any company that's running large scale data operations, uh, running, running data pipelines, right? you know, stacks like Hadoop and Spark or Databricks and Snowflake, you'll have challenges in bringing together all the telemetry data, as well as monitoring these pipelines, understanding how they're performing, understanding who's using what and how much, getting alerted when anomalous behavior or inefficiencies happen. So Unravel tackles this problem by collecting all of this telemetry information in one place and then applying AI ML algorithms to automatically spot these inefficiencies and fix them. So today's talk will be about the entire journey that enterprises are going through as they are modernizing their data stacks and data pipelines. So first of all, what is a data pipeline? I'm sure a lot of you have heard that term, but the way we think about data pipelines is they are those entities that convert all the rich and varied and high volume data sources into insights that are powering very innovative data products that many of you are actually running today. And a typical data pipeline has this flavor of it is, uh, it has a phase where data is being captured a lot of the time continuously, the data gets stored into distributed storage systems like a data lake or a data warehouse. A lot of computation happens on the data to transform it into those uh, key insights that you might want to extract from the data. And this uh, insights, uh, as well as any features that you're extracting from the data would be published and then made available to all the consumers. And this is how these uh, really innovative data products actually work. And this entire process is what we would call a data pipeline. And as you can see, these data pipelines can actually be pretty complex. So many enterprises who have already built a whole bunch of their data pipelines, especially on stacks like such as Hadoop, right, or using solutions like you know, Hive and HDFS and all of that. And they have created these pipelines over a course of time. And many of these pipelines are getting orchestrated with what you might call enterprise schedulers like a Tidal or Autosys or Informatica, Pentaho, and there are many such ones, as well as there are like you know, native ones, for instance, Hadoop comes with this native scheduler or orchestrator called Uzi. So in these environments, a lot of the time, people actually face challenges such as the clusters are heavily multi-tenant and maybe different apps struggle for resources. Maybe the pipelines are not meeting all their SLAs. And these environments often tend to be less agile. So in terms of adding like you know, more and more uh, capabilities or releasing your apps faster, and they tend to be harder to scale, again, having to do with the fact that many of, most of the time, they're actually in large like you know, data centers where you may not be able to add resources easily. And this is forcing many of these enterprises to modernize their stacks. And in the process, they're actually picking really interesting and uh, innovative uh, schedulers, such as Airflow, as well as they're changing their stack to incorporate systems like a Databricks or a Snowflake or Amazon EMR. And in this effort, what these companies are often shooting for is like, you know, instead of running large multi-tenant clusters, can we run more focused, app-focused environments, right? Such as, hey, like, you know, for a pipeline, I can run my cluster and bring that up when my pipeline needs resources and scale it accordingly. These newer environments tend to be more agile and easier to scale because you can decouple storage from compute and then allocate resources, like, you know, as and when you need them. And the goals in this exercise often like you know, predominantly shoot uh, towards agility, increase agility, as well as uh, 
you know, also the fact that now resources are no longer the constraint in how fast you can release your apps and uh, drive ROI. And another goal that often comes, especially given the fact that environments um, such as these Hadoop clusters are often size for their peak and the resource usage might actually be uh, pretty poor, you also have the opportunity to reduce cost in this modernization exercise. And why do, like, you know, why does uh, Airflow get picked a lot of the time as part of this modernization? The goals with which Airflow was created often ties in very nicely with the goals of the modernization itself. For example, Airflow enables very agile development, right? as well as it's much better suited for the cloud native architectures compared to traditional schedulers, especially in terms of how fast you can customize or extend it. And last but not the least, in keeping with the, uh, the modern um, methodology of agility, Airflow is also available as a service from companies like Astronomer and Amazon. You start to dive deeper into modernization itself. At high level, it falls into two phases. Uh, there is the assessing and planning phase, as well as the, the actual migration and then validation and optimization that comes with that. So let's take a deeper look. I'll start by presenting some of the key lessons that we have learned as we have helped a large number of enterprises migrate from their traditional enterprise schedulers and uh, traditional stacks to Airflow and a modern data stack. First and foremost, let's see what an assess and plan phase of modernization looks like. It involves a list of phases internally, such as first you have to discover all the pipelines that need to be migrated. And then you'll have to understand the resource usage of these pipelines, and more importantly, all the dependencies that these pipelines might have. And as part of this process, then you might need to understand the complexity of uh, modernizing these pipelines. Some of these uh, pipelines that run on-prem can actually have thousands of stages and may run for many hours. And with that, then comes the challenge of then mapping these pipelines to the target environment, as, as well as uh, estimating the cost and the effort of the migration itself. So two of the key lessons that we have learned as we've helped customers, first and foremost, don't take the pipeline discovery itself, like and don't underestimate its, uh, its complexity. A lot of the time in these environments, not one, but multiple schedulers might be getting used. So we have seen customers who are running Tidal and along with that running uh, an Informatic and Uzi pipelines as well. And worse, there may not be any common pattern in how these pipelines actually work in how they access data, in how they schedule these apps, in how they even name these apps or how they actually allocate resources. And all of this then leads to you need very fine grained tracking from a telemetry data perspective to actually do good resource usage estimation, like you know, dependency, understanding the dependencies, as well as then map the complexity as well as cost of running these pipelines in a newer environment. So let's take a deeper dive. And here I have an example to illustrate like you know, some of these uh, concepts and all the lessons that we have learned. What you see here is actually an example of one app. It is a hype query that is being run by a workflow. This is, uh, it turns out to be a Tidal workflow. The Tidal enterprise schedule is being used. You can see the metadata such as like, you know, which uh, user is submitting it, which cluster is being run. But even more importantly, there are other key things such as hey, what is the input data this app is reading and what is the output data that it's kind of writing to. And along with that, all the important KPIs like the duration, which might be important for the, ensuring that your SLAs are being met after migration or the amount of IO, which might be important to estimate the cost once this migration is actually completed. Once you're collecting all of this fine grained data, you can start building what we actually call a, a lineage graph. So I've illustrated a lineage graph here. Uh, for simplicity, you can think of the graph as having the yellow nodes, which represent the application itself, such as this high query, as well as the green, like you know the green dots which uh, represent the data sets the input and output data sets and as you start to build this information from the fine grain of apps being scheduled you'll quickly realize that the overall lineage graph of even a single pipeline might be might be pretty complex right but once this information has been extracted it can be used in many different ways to estimate and simplify the entire journey of migration uh, First on the assessing and planning, and as Hari will tell you how it can be used in the migrating, validating, and optimizing. 
let's just like you know, deep dive into a simple example here on how this uh, data has helped our customers. A lot of the time, customers don't migrate the entire pipelines and their entire workload in one shot. It is actually split into waves. But then you have to decide what is the order of these waves. A common way in which uh, these waves actually work, especially if your motivation is to free up resources and reduce cost, then you might want to use the annotated lineage graph to identify those pipelines those con like that contain jobs, which might actually have a huge resource need, but not all the time. And these are great fits for the elasticity of a modern environment, such as uh, Databricks or an EMR. And at the same time, on the other hand, if you are optimizing for agility, maybe you want to focus on migrating those pipelines first that might be generating very popular data assets that might be getting consumed by many like you know, tenants in your organization. And once you migrate these pipelines, very quickly you can improve the agility because the tenants can then start using their platform of choice, maybe EMR, maybe Databricks, or maybe Snowflake to then start extracting uh, value from data and shipping their apps faster. So that was a quick overview of the lessons that we have learned in the assessing and planning phase. Now I'm going to hand over to Hari, who will take us through the lessons that we have learned in the actual migrating, validating, and the optimization phase. Over to you, Hari. Thanks, Yamnath. So what we have seen until now are various methodologies that have to do with, you know, identifying these artifacts for migration that Shivnath was talking about and describe, uh, discovering the dependencies between them. Gracias. Bye. However, uh, there is also the need to instill uh, an actual sense and measure of confidence in this entire migration process. And this can be achieved by validating the operational side of the migration journey. So data pipelines, regardless of where they live, are prone to suffer from the same issues like, you know, failures, SLA misses, inconsistent results, etc. And specifically, if it's a data streaming pipeline, for example, it might suffer from you know, throughput and latency issues. Also on the cloud, it's the, there's this huge matter of cost that comes in. So uh, one needs to be very sensitive to cost overruns and such. So to overall maintain the quality of our data pipelines during and after migration, we need to cons consistently evaluate uh, these pipelines against three major factors, which are correctness, performance, and cost. So let's just take a deeper look at each of these three. So when we are talking about correctness, uh, we are talking basically more about uh, data quality, right? So artifacts uh, such as tables, views, or CSV files are uh, generated in almost every stage of the pipeline. So what we need to do is that we need to lay down certain data checks at these stages so that we can make sure that things are consistent across board. For example, uh, a check could be like, you know, the partitions of a table should have at least uh, n number of records. Or another check could be that uh, a column of this table should never be null, should never have null values. So there are tools in the in industry out there like uh, great expectations, which make it very easy to uh, define and maintain such uh, validation checks and integrate it into the pipeline itself. When it comes to uh, evaluating performance, uh, a lot of this has to do with uh, setting SLAs and maintaining baselines for your pipeline. So most con orchestrators have this concept of SLA monitoring baked in itself. Uh, for example, airflow, uh, the notion of an SLA is injected in the operator itself. Uh, you could think about Uzi, which has this SLA tag, which could be leveraged in the workflow definition XML. So SLA is more, more or less taken care of uh, by an orchestrator itself. And also during our migration analysis and planning phase, uh, if our resource allocations uh, have has been uh, properly estimated, uh, a lot of time, a lot of these times, we see that SLAs are more or less, you know, similar and are maintained. But in the case uh, so something unexpected arises, uh, tools like Unravel can help maintain baselines and uh, help us uh, potentially troubleshoot and tune our pipelines by identifying bottlenecks and uh, suggesting uh, performance improvements. And finally, uh, we come to cost, right? So cost is uh, paramount on the cloud. And one of the most important activities uh, as part of planning the migration, uh, which Shivna talked about, is budgeting and estimation of this cost that these pipelines uh, would incur. 
Uh, once again, uh, Unravel can help uh, uh, us monitor the cost uh, 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 on the cloud. And also, uh, we are, since we are uh, collecting this telemetry data and also interfacing with uh, uh, cloud vendors, we can offer vendor-specific insights uh, that can help minimize uh, the running cost of uh, these pipelines on the cost uh, on the cloud. I'm sorry. So uh, I will now switch over to a, a quick demo. So just to uh, set the stage, uh, a lot of our enterprise customers uh, are migrating from the more traditional on-prem pipelines like uh, Tidal and Uzi to Airflow. And the use cases that I uh, go through in this demo are actually motivated by real scenarios that customers have faced in their uh, migration journey. So uh, here we see uh, Unravel has sent out a Slack alert to a channel letting an admin know about some inconsistencies in the pipeline that has been just recently migrated. Uh, this could do with uh, a missing SLA, it could do with a, a cost overrun, or it could do be, uh, with some validations uh, regarding data. So let's take a look at each of these use cases. So if you see here, uh, we have our pipeline, the reporting insights hourly pipeline that has been migrated to the cloud. And uh, what we see basically is that the, its running time uh, on the cloud is much higher than what it's uh, what it's uh, what is its baseline. So if you see the running time uh, in the cloud is close to five minutes, these values are in milliseconds, while uh, the baseline runs uh, within a minute. So that's why uh, we can label, we are collecting this information and uh, based, based on that, we assign it a label which is called delayed. And we detect, Unravel can detect this and basically serve up an insight uh, which has a link in, embedded in it, which when clicked, we can take a look at what's happening uh, uh, at the cluster level. So if we do that, uh, we come to the Unravel UI where we can take a closer look at what's really happening. And we see that uh, this particular cluster, which was assigned to this app, also is being shared by another resource intensive app, which is basically hogging up all the allocated uh, memory and other resources. So uh, this is a very pretty common use case that we see. And uh, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the more uh, uh, accepted ways to uh, work around this is basically, uh, since these clusters on the cloud are all already app focused, it would make sense to carve out a cluster specifically for this app so that it can run and basically decouple these two apps and that uh, the other cluster can run this app uh, independently and we have enough resources so that our pipeline can complete uh, within the proper SQL. Uh, the next uh, uh, use case which we have is uh, to do with cost. So, if we take uh, another example here, so uh, we see that in this particular pipeline, the job inside aggregate v4 pipeline. So this has been migrated uh, to the cloud already. And uh, we see that uh, later runs of this pipeline, right? Specifically this run, 17th March 21 on 716, uh, 7.5. Uh, we see that it has taken around $12. Uh, it has costed around $12 on the cost. Uh, on the cloud and what we see is that the baseline is around uh, two and a half dollars so that's why uh, we can uh, we again attribute a cost over and label to this and uh, if you want to take a closer look at what has happened uh, we can basically um, we can basically take a, a look at this gantt chart view so this gantt chart view what it does is basically uh, is entails all the running components within the pipeline and it is pretty apparent to see that the later runs of this pipeline are running more com uh, components compared to the baseline run. So uh, what would this mean is that the developer who actually owns this pipeline has made some changes to the pipeline. And this is pretty common in on-prem uh, cases where you know you might make changes uh, for uh, in the com components of a pipeline, the logic of the pipeline uh, to optimize certain parameters. But on the cloud, this has uh, major implications. Uh, which it could actually result in a blow up of the cost in, uh, as uh, shown here. And Unravel can actually detect uh, these, uh, these changes and it can help uh, uh, us uh, admins communicate this fact to the developers better. And finally, uh, we come to our uh, last scenario which has to do with validations, right? So uh, as uh, Shivnath was talking about, uh, 
while we are migrating our pipelines uh, from the on-prem to cloud, the only way to uh, actually guarantee correctness is to put in place uh, certain validation checks. So uh, what happens is when, when these pipelines runs, these validation uh, checks are evaluated. And based on that, we can come up with a confident estimate of you know, how uh, well our pipeline is doing and that we have uh, and we have not actually violated any valid validation check. Uh, in this case, what we see that this pipeline after migrating to the cloud, uh, it is, uh, it's OK, do, it's, it's meeting its SLA, its cost is under control. But we see that there's certain validation checks that have failed uh, that have to do with data quality. So uh, this is where the tools like Great Expectations come in. And uh, Unravel's extensible architecture allows us to interface with such tools. So uh, you could easily use the Great Expectation operator available in Airflow to uh, define and you know, uh, integrate uh, a certain suite of validations to your Airflow DAG and pipeline. And say if something fails, the, uh, the action that Great Expectations can do is to communicate uh, the results of the failure to the Unravel backend, which is then used to render uh, the view which you see here. And uh, if you see, uh, we have all the information which we uh, received from Great Expectations, wherein what was the actual da data asset that uh, violated, uh, which is this customer table which causes, caused the violation. Uh, this was a pipeline which actually, uh, the code which actually caused, the instance of the code that actually caused the violation. And what was the exact violation, which was you know that uh, one violation failed basically, uh, where the row count, uh, row, number of rows in the table should have been less than 10,000, but uh, it has gone up to say 19,000. So we spe very specifically know what went wrong. And then we can use this, uh, admins and you developers can use this information uh, to further introspect their pipelines and see uh, what is the issue and then fix it. So hopefully, uh, in conclusion, uh, I hope that uh, this presentation has uh, aptly described uh, the lessons that we have learned while migrating uh, data pipelines from enterprise schedulers uh, to Airflow. And uh, uh, please uh, contact us in case of any questions. And feel free to uh, sign up for the free trial if you would like to uh, evaluate the product uh, for yourself. And uh, uh, Keep a lookout for our next talk uh, in the Airflow Summit, which has to do with uh, data pipeline health check for correctness, performance, and cost efficiency, which uh, Shivnath will be presenting.